Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of the I2B2 Transmart Foundation uh, Symposium. Um, we're going to kick off the day with our first session, uh, the User Interface Working Group, and so we'll pass it on to uh, Griffin Weber. Hello, thank you. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, uh, this is the User Interface Working Group. Um, I lead this uh, very active working group, and so I'm going to give you an overview of what we do, and we have a couple guest speakers, Anna Palmer-Moram and Nils Gellenborg. So our agenda for this hour, I'm going to give a brief overview of what our working group is about and what we've been doing the past couple years. I know most of you on the phone um, are not uh, members of that group or don't always uh, attend it. So usually at the annual symposium, I kind of give an overview of what we do. Um, our individual meetings, we drill down a lot more depth uh, compared to what we're going to look at today. Anna Palma will be giving a demo of the new Shrine Act user interface. This was uh, one of the major uh, projects we did as a working group, working with Shrine on this. And then Nils will join us um, uh, after that to go over the clinical, the covidclinical.net website. This was uh, the website we created for the 4CE um, consortium project, and in particular the various visualizations his group built for that. Uh, and then we, if we have some time at the end, we'll talk a little bit about um, what topics people would like to see at these working group meetings over the next several months. So this user interface working group was created a couple years ago for three goals. The first is to understand the UI differences between various versions of I2B2 and Transmart, all the different customizations. When this group first created, most of us were either I2B2 or Transmart. We didn't really have any understanding of what the other program did. And there had been a bunch of other user interfaces that were had been created or being created for these platforms that we weren't even aware of. So just what is, what is out there? Second is learning how similar programs have addressed our UI challenges. ITB and Transmart aren't the only programs that have queries or uh, temporal constraints or other things in there. So how have other programs addressed these issues? And then uh, being able to identify and help coordinate ongoing efforts to improve and extend the user interfaces. And this is again our collaboration with um, Shrine and Act is a great example of that. Uh, this is kind of a quick summary of what we did in the first year. We mainly focused on in-depth walkthroughs of several different uh, uh, programs related to our foundation. So there's an I2B2 web client as well as a workbench, and the new Temple interface came out that year. Um, that's the second Peter Rice um, gave us tours of Transmart. Uh, we looked at Shrine uh, and some new programs that I hadn't really even heard of before forming this working group, one called Glowing Bear, created out by the Hive in Europe, and Leaf, um, Big Dob, and others at UW. And then there's the out-of-the-box programs, but then we, we found out that most institutions do some kinds of customization. There's at least their own logo or branding to put on it and a lot of other things that um, sites do to either extend functionality or remove functionality uh, if it's not needed at the organization. So just some examples of this is the ITB2 interface. It has tons of different functionality and features that have been built up over the past 15 years. Um, however, sometimes it can be overwhelming for a brand new user who just wants to know how many patients are in the electronic health record system. So you know, this is an example of a feature-rich interface, but it may be a bit of a learning curve to be able to really use this effectively. On kind of the opposite extreme, the picture application, which we heard a bit from Paul Avalok yesterday, goes to the sort of simple Google-like interface, which is just a box where you type in what you want. Um, and, you know, that's, it doesn't have a lot of the functionality that the ITV2 UI has, but you know, this is kind of the, the, the other extreme on um, uh, as simple as, uh, as you can be. Glowing Bear takes it a little step further. There are these boxes where you can type in um, the concepts you're looking for. However, it brings back some of the things like the, the browse, drag and drop, and the constraints that you can't add on to concepts. 
And this is something that's really nice. It's been actually in the works for a while at the University of Washington, but um, it was only open source over a year ago. And um, uh, it's been gaining a lot of traction and people really like it. Um, they were former I2B2 users. So you can see a lot of familiar I2B2 stuff here, um, but they really sort of rethought it from the ground up and um, how to design it for more modern look and feel and to make it in a way that's a little bit more intuitive uh, to new users. And of course, Transmart, uh, it doesn't have a lot of the query capabilities that ITB2 does, but it adds on many different types of analysis and visualization uh, tools. So it's a, it's a complementary um, piece it's a, instead of kind of an alternative user interface for ITB2. The second year, we've our big project again was working with the Shrine and Act Group to create a brand new user interface. And Apama will um, have a whole talk on this in a few minutes. Um, the focus is on the novice users. So how can you leverage some of the uh, uh, capabilities of I2B2 and Shrine, but have it uh, be easier for someone who's never seen I2B2 before to understand how to construct queries and how to interpret the results. Um, a lot of what this working group did was review some of the early wireframes, uh, mock-ups, and provided some really helpful suggestions that inform the, the design of this. We kind of had a few different user groups that we worked with. They were um, kind of going out to people who really had never seen ITB2 before and getting their feedback. What this group provided was the expert users. We both, uh, the members of this working group, have used these programs for many years, and we also helped and trained many investigators. So there were a lot of really great insights that came out of this working group. We did, in year one, we did some deep dives into each separate program. In this in year two, we did deep dives into specific features and compared across different programs. So looking at ontology and how to browse and search ontology, how is that done in these different programs? Uh, modifiers and temporal queries. These are complicated things where there really isn't perfect, one, one perfect way of doing this. Um, so we spent quite a bit of time looking at the different approaches and that different user interfaces took and why they, why they did it that way versus a different way. Um, one big thing that came out of all this was uh, the uh, leaf had reorganized how you do search results. So when you're searching for uh, through the ontology, like here I'm on the left, I'm searching ITB21.7.11 for major depressive disorder. It gives a long list of concepts. And what happens is you lose the context of it. So it looks like a lot of things. There are repetitive or there's kind of duplicates of others on the list. And you're not sure what to drag over. On the uh, leaf kind of looks like on the right where the items are organized based on where they are in your actual ontology. And there are things that actually match your search results here in green, as well as it shows all the paths leading back up to the root inside the ontology. So this gives you context of um, what matches your search and where it, um, where it sits within the rest of the stuff. So LEAF developed this originally, and then both I2B2 implemented it in there, 1.7.12, and as you'll see in Anapama's demo, um, the Shrine Act group put that into theirs. Um, well, uh, we we talked a lot between this type of user interface and something that Glowing Bear does. Glowing Bear, rather than kind of having a browse view and a search view, when you search something, it just opens up the browse to where you where you uh, to the items that you search for. And it's really it works really nice for a small ontology, but we've uh, for things like a clinical trial where there may be a limited number of variables that are being collected. We actually kind of prefer Glowing Bear to Leaf in those situations, but in large ontologies, ACT, for example, has over 2 million concepts. Uh, the Leaf seems to work better, uh, approach seems to work better there because it, it reduces the amount of scrolling you have to do when there's potentially hundreds of things that match. So that's the kind of level of depth that we, we were talking about in these meetings. Um, modifiers is a challenge. This is what uh, it looks like in ITB2 if you're just trying to get a medication where you want to specify the dose, frequency, and route. You have to drill down through all these modifiers in the ontology on the left and create three different uh, panel groups, and you have to link them through a um, same instance temporal query. So it's, you can do a lot of things with modifiers in ITB2, but it's not at all intuitive and 
that's really complex through the user interface. Uh, when we look in other applications, for example, Leaf has a much cleaner, simpler way of doing modifiers, but you, uh, you lose a bunch of the, uh, the complexity of what you can actually do and how you organize modifiers inside of ITB2. So we looked at several different approaches. Uh, we, we didn't come to a consensus yet on what's the best one. You know, this will probably be, we'll co probably come back to this again in year three. Temporal queries is a similar thing where um, there are many ways of doing temporal queries. Uh, the sort of originally in I2B2, we made kind of an arbitrarily complex temporal query builder, but it can be really overwhelming for um, almost everybody. Uh, I2B2 has a new simpler one that came out last year, but there's still other approaches that we're going to be looking at um, uh, right away in the next couple months. Future working group topics. Uh, this was an original list we created right at the beginning at, of the formation of this user group at one of these annual symposiums. And uh, it's been edited a little bit as we've worked through some things and other stuff has come up. It generally falls into three big groups. The first is building queries, so things like modifiers, temporal queries. We haven't gotten to it yet, but I think we'll get to it soon. But family relationship stuff. So if you're trying to find a a mother and a baby who might both have um, uh, tested positive for COVID, like how do you link that stuff together? Um, querying for specimens and other kinds of entity ties, especially in transmart use cases. Um, another whole kind of session on data quality and data insight. So what's the best way of displaying to the interface information about ontology items, such as data quality, counts by year, retired um, terms, and so on. Uh, consortium quality measures. So in a federated query like Shrine, how do you show that certain sites might have more data than others or that uh, uh, certain types of data haven't passed data quality thresholds? There's health services and util healthcare utilization concepts, things like the number of data facts a patient has. How do we display that in the user interface? And generating different kind of timelines and other uh, visualizations that will help people gain data insights and understand the patient populations. And then some general functionality things like um, best way of logging in and workflows within your institutions, localization of different languages. And then also uh, what's really important when we think about user interfaces is that whenever we design new functionality that we would love for the UI, it has to be built on a corresponding piece on the back end. So there were, when we were developing the new Shrine user interface, there were limitations on what we could do in the user interface based on just what's capable out of the existing APIs on the back end. So uh, even though this is a user interface working group, it's very tied into what the ontology, how that's structured and uh, how, how the ontology is organized as well as what the back end software um, allows you to do. So with that, I'm gonna see Santa Palma. Yes, I see she's here. Awesome, thank you, Griffin. Great. All right. So is everyone able to see my screen? Yep, we see it. Awesome, yes. thank you. Um, so, oh, let me get rid of that. So, uh, good morning. Um, uh, I'm Anupama Maram. I work at Harvard Catalyst as a senior business analyst for the Shrine team. Um, and thank you, Griffin, for also allocating time for me this morning. It also really gives me a chance to say thank you to the members of the I2B2 Transmart UI Working Group um, for donating your lunch hour to talk through these requirements and designs for the new web client. The end product looks really great in my opinion and we were only able to get to that point because we were able to really iterate um, and get that rapid feedback from the community. Uh, my goal today um, while doing the demo is to highlight some key decision points and showcase how we incorporated that feedback we got from the community into the new um, web client and how it really helped evolve the overall um, design. Um, in my uh, last slides, um, I want to really encourage to continue um, participating in these sessions when we are able to hear from the community about what is needed and um, what the feedback is, we can create a better product to serve everyone. So thank you. Um, a lot of you are probably really familiar with the acronyms listed here. Um, so I won't go through them too much in detail, um, but I will focus on ACT, which is the stands for the accrual to clinical trials. 
it's a federated query network and it, it uses the Shrine web client to connect the I2B2 infrastructure at all of the sites. Um, the existing Shrine interface um, was derived from and closely resembles the I2B2 code that is now over 12 years old. Um, there are some differences in features between the I2B2 and Shrine applications. They do not have a one-to-one -one feature match. And one of the key difference um, is that um, Shrine displays the patient count, patient count from each of the network sites, whereas I2B2 displays the count for the one site. Um, so have you seen the ACT network is growing and in order to better serve the needs of the research audience, we wanted to build up a more intuitive, user-friendly interface that incorporated modern standards of um, design, usability, look and feel, and accessibility. Uh, we wanted to continue support the existing use case, which was cohort discovery and study feasibility. And in order to really make sure we were building for novice users, we made some underlying assumptions about um, who, who the novice users are. So it's not exactly a persona, but in a similar spirit. And that really helped in making our, uh, in our decision-making process. Sorry, I just wanna make sure I'm, okay. Um, and what we really were focusing on was that these novice users uh, may be unfamiliar with I2B2 or EHR data. Um, in that response, we wanted to make sure we selected, selected functionality that was the most useful to novice users. Um, and like all projects, we had a one-year um, timeline constraint. So you might recognize the screenshot. It's the Shrine um, UI that is currently on um, the ACT production network. Um, so we are focusing on novice users. And by design, we decided to not include all of the features. Um, so we really had to make sure we were selecting features that were most essential to novice users. Um, I will note that when we do release, we will be supporting two web clients, the existing um, web client, which be geared more towards advanced users, um, and then the new web client, which has all of those essential features for novice users. One of our um, really big goals was to improve the existing search. The ACT ontology has over 2 million concepts, so we really wanted to make sure we were making it easy for users to locate the concepts they were looking for. Um, another design goal of ours was to avoid technical jargon. Um, in the old web client, we used the word query a lot. We used the word ontology. And so we really wanted to remove this verbiage from the UI so it wouldn't confuse users what it meant. Um, and we also wanted to make sure there was a clear progression of the workflow. So that's use of our colors and use of sort of different workflow steps and tabs to inform and signal an action to the user. So this is, um, slide is mostly just highlighting the work we've done in the past year and a half. Um, not only does it include development, but it also includes all of the homework and background work we did prior to starting the project. Um, again, we really wanted to make sure we were building the right tool for the right audience. I'll talk more about these points. There is an ACT session from three to four today where I'll be giving uh, a deeper dive of the demo. So that's, um, I have more uh, talking points about how we went about these internal and external analysis. Um, but this is more just to point out how it was really key in helping us develop our first two concepts. Um, so there is about three key decisions that we um, that the we went back to the community to constantly get feedback on to make sure we were headed in the right direction. So one of the first um, decision points was how do we um, lay out the template and how do we orient the user into how they construct their query. Um, in the current act, um, in the current Shrine um, UI that's on production, um, we have a horizontal layout. So you build your query from left to right. Um, we, uh, when we presented our concepts, we decided to um, present these concepts to see how users felt about a vertical layout. So building from the top to bottom. And so if, based on the feedback, we were able to head in this direction. Um, so in last year's session, we presented these two concepts. We, in the morning session, um, we actually did a deep dive into some of the iterations of the designs and requirements. So how we 
you know, phrase the query helper text, how we specified exclusion criteria, how to um, specify date ranges. Um, and the afternoon is where we presented these final two concepts and also really, you know, gave us some really concrete feedback on which direction we should go in. The, section, the second uh, key decision point, Griffin had already mentioned this, is about how we structure the search. Um, you know, like I mentioned, the ontology has over 2 million concepts, which can be extremely overwhelming to a user. Um, so we really wanted users to appreciate the completeness of the ontology, but really able to help them quickly locate the needle in the haystack for their concepts. Um, so of the different UIs we discussed, um, with the working group, we also had a short survey just to get some really quick feedback on what features they thought were the most important. Um, I just put together some examples here. Um, so like growing, uh, Glowing Bear was great about the way they display their search results is um, they expanded all of the folders in that browse view. So um, it highlighted the matching search criteria, but it kept it in context of the hierarchy. So you could easily identify um, neighboring concepts. Um, like Griffin mentioned for LEAF, it consolidated that view. And instead of showing the neighboring concepts, it only shows um, the search results and the relative path to those matching results. And then here is um, the existing shrine uh, layout. So you can see that there's two tabs here and there's a lot of uh, selections that a user has to make before they um, can find the term that they're looking for. And the third key decision point was sort of how do you get users to run their query and how to the, do they go about viewing their results. So these are just a few um, designs we iterated on with the working group to sort of, again, get their feedback on and, and try to understand what made the most sense. So I'm going to transition now to sort of where we ended up with the interface. So as you can see, um, there's two big things that are really different from the uh, existing UI. We actually decided to break up the um, one page application into separate tabs. So um, the tabs are really focused on getting that one task complete. So in this tab, the focus is to build out your inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, again, pointing out that we excluded the word query. Um, and then we have a separate tab all together where you can look at all of your previous results um, and, and view the counts for it. Um, we also decided to consolidate the view for the search. So instead of having that two panel layout, we decided to incorporate the search and the browse into one consolidated view. Um, we also created new root folders here. This is more just to help categorize um, the dozen uh, domains, and so it's really easy for a user to parse through them. You also notice that we call, um, call it the medical concept list, um, so that it's just really clear to a user what that is versus having to um, figure out what an, what an ontology is. Um, we've also consolidated the search, so it always defaults to search all the concepts, but users can filter based on the domain here. And we did also implement a, um, a auto suggest. So this helps in terms of helping the user find the right term and also avoid any type of common misspells that might happen. So if I just decide to select this term here, it's informing me there's about you know, 1200 concepts that contain the term diabetes mellitus. When I search, you'll notice that it changed from that browse view into the leaf-like consolidated view. That way, it's really um, a way for the user to be able to see all of their results in the same view without having to scroll. Um, I can also filter here by the specific code set I'm looking for. So if I decide to implement this search, and now it's only showing me the search results for diabetes mellitus in the ICD-10 diagnostic folder. Um, another key thing that we um, wanted to make sure we had was this uh, auto generate the name. We heard from users that that was a really important feature for them to, for us to uh, continue to have in the new web client. Let me just 
account this here so you can sort of see this in real time. Um, so this is one of the really cool new features that we have. Um, again, this is from feedback from the working group. So as the query is being sent out to the network, we're able to display sort of an aggregate count up here. So you to it tallies up to the total number of uh, possible patients you might be able to find. So I am doing a more in-depth uh, demo later this afternoon from three to four. So I'll be talking a little more, um, more in detail about some of the decisions we made in terms of the technical architecture and the auto suggest and a little more showing a little more of the features. So I want to take a second to talk about challenges beyond just the UI. So one of the things we were really hoping to do is making it easier for novice users to go through the process of trying to build a query, but there is still a step of helping them translate into the best uh, query. So some of the challenges that we're constantly thinking about ways to address is sort of issues of data characterization, making sure um, you know, data completeness and addressing concerns of data quality. Um, we're, there's also differences in coding practices between sites. Um, there's also you know, different patient populations at different sites and also the amount of data that's been um, loaded into each site. And then there's also the challenge of how do we identify collaborators to recruit patients. One of the things we've done specifically for the ACT network is this next steps tab. Um, so right now this points to the main page of the ACT network, but there will be a resource page here that Griffin is working on with the data harmonization team to really help users um, figure out what is their most appropriate next steps once you've been able to obtain all those patient counts. So our next steps. So after um, this first release, the most immediate thing we'll be working on is temporal constraints um, and breakdowns. And so we're working to understand how they're currently being used, what reasons they're being used for. And also if you're not using them, that would be also really great to hear and like why um, you haven't been using them. So like I mentioned, this group has been so helpful in providing feedback. Um, we've also set up a, uh, a sandbox. So if you're interested in providing more detailed feedback, um, we have been holding one-to-one 45-minute -one, to hour-long sessions um, with me and walking through the web client. So thank you for everyone who's participated in this. And if you would uh, still like to um, participate in it, just feel free to send me an email or um, visit this link. Thank you. That's all I have for today. Thank you so much, Anna Palma. I mean, this is uh, this is really great. I hope that at some point this user interface can be um, used for standalone ITB2 instances and not just Shrine, um, because I know some great elements here. And uh, there's there's an excellent team that's that developed this interface, but um, we all we all know that um, a lot of it was made possible because of the feedback from all different people we showed this to, in particular this um, working group. So um, we we again appreciate all the all the help um, that this group did over the past year. I haven't seen a lot of. Uh, things in the chat box or Q&A. Um, maybe it's a combination of being early in the morning or just uh, um, sort of watching the, watching the show as uh, Anna Palmer goes through all of that. Are there, any, are there any quick questions before we switch to Nils' part? Question, why not keep one instance only act? It's different technologies. Um, ACT has its own set of um, APIs and software that this is built for. Um, it would have to be, uh, either this interface would have to be sort of rewritten to work directly on the I2P2 um, APIs um, or uh, some of the Shrine back, Shrine back end, I2P2 back end functionality would have to be merged. Um, you know, it just kind of has to do with resources and how this was ultimately built. There's also some design changes. You know, we, in, but 
Mar uh, Anna Palmer showed is that how the, you switch to a separate screen to view all the site results. We need that in order to have enough space to be able to display 60 sites. Whereas in a standard ITB2, when they're just one count, it may, it may be better to show that count on the main query screen. So there, there's some little design issues as well. This was sort of a one year project to um, put together sort of quickly a, a simpler nov novice interface for the ACT network. Um, but you know, over time, we'll be looking at um, other ways of using this interface and other applications for it. Question, but if we have trinetics, then purpose of I2B2 gets defeated. Um, so this, this question comes up sometimes on uh, if trinetics is out there, why do we need shrine or I2B2 at all even? And you know, there, trinetics and, and open source tools like shrine and I2B2 are built for somewhat different purposes. Trinetics is a commercial tool. Um, academics at lot, some of the institutions use it quite heavily. I know Hopkins and others are, um, uh, they use Trinetics more than um, their own site. I'm at Beth Isodigas Medical Center. We do not have Trinetics, so it's not an option for users. And you know, there different networks have um, different goals to it. In addition to Trinetics and, um, and Trinact, there's PopMedNet, Odyssey, others. And um, I think there's benefits of having these different networks as they go in different directions. They develop different features. As we saw with LEAF, LEAF went and kind of built its own thing based on OMOP. Um, but by going in their direction, they developed a lot of really useful things that we're able to pull back into this. I think over time, some of these different efforts will you know, merge or have greater overlap and be more compatible with each other. Um, so uh, that's uh, not to say it's always going to be like this, but um, uh, you know, if, if you're a user who that institution that has Trinetics available and it has the patient cohort set you're looking for, it's certainly, um, uh, there are a lot of advantages to that tool as opposed to some of the other ones. And if you're an institution like mine, you know, the ICBT Shrine um, is the only available option. Uh, Matthew, um, you're on the phone here. Do you want to make, do you want to say anything about the Trinex user interface. We have not discussed it a lot in this working group. Um, it's somewhat of a pro proprietary nature. I don't know um, if that will change at all at some point. Uh, sure. Thanks, Griffin. So uh, to uh, to echo what you just said about about the question, uh, you know, there's no doubt that uh, there's there's place for both. Uh, everybody knows that Trinetics uh, began uh, our roots are very much in the I2B2 community. Uh, when we tell our story, we talk about the fact that the first common data model that served as the source of data for Trinetics was I2B2. Uh, you know, it's been, it's been, as I said yesterday, six years. We've grown and uh, are now consuming other sources, but we're very much sort of steeped in the tradition of I2B2 in the in the ideas uh, of it and are really honored to be here and to support the community. I, I don't think it's either one or the other, obviously. I, I agree with what Griffin says. Different, uh, different goals, uh, slightly different goals, uh, obviously slightly different directions, but we certainly, I mean, I certainly see these, these uh, directions as complementing one another. As far as the user interface, so um, maybe maybe uh, it makes sense at some point to quickly show what Trinetics UI looks like. But basically, we early on we decided that we will use the search paradigm instead of browse. I think that's the biggest difference when somebody looks at Trinetics UI and compares it to the well familiar web client of I2B2. But you know there are there are only so many ways of skinning that cat. We're still dealing with very similar, very similar user uh, 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 interface terminologies. We all call them different things: I2B2 ontology, Trinetics master terminology, etc. But it's it, you know at the, at the end of the day, it's just a list of diagnosis and a list of drugs and so on. 
and they are really long and complicated and uh, it's difficult for users to find those things. But, but it's, uh, you know, it's going to be remarkably similar, presenting the number of patients associated with concepts, you know, thinking of them as uh, hierarchies, as nested folders, and so on and so on. Thanks, Happy. I see there's a question from Bruce. I'm wondering about the possibility of using the ACTOR ITB2 system for a focused data mine for a particular clinical data domain, such as Crohn's disease um, registries. So I think this varies a little bit by institution. At Beth Israel, we have several different ITB2s, one for our main I local ITB2, another one for ACT networks. Um, sometimes uh, hospitals will sort of spin off an ITB2 for a specific um, application. Um, ITB2 has both a, an enterprise mode as well as project specific modes. So you can set up um, a, a specific project inside of ITB2 and give a limited number of users access to it and they can query certain data elements not available in the full one. There's a lot just to how you configure ITB2 to an institution what data you load into it. Um, this is you, ITB2 is usually for you know, an institution or informatic person to kind of down to install it. We usually don't expect a researcher to on their own um, like download ITB2 onto their desktop and, and use it like that. Griffin, we have a question um, from, I think we have a raised hand from Bradley Taylor. I'm going to um, unmute him and allow him to talk. Okay. Bradley, I believe you're able to now enable yourself to talk. Bradley, do you have a question? It may have just been a, a misraised hand. I'll we'll, we'll we'll circle back with Bradley if he if he wants to ask a question. Okay, I want to make sure we have plenty of time for Neil. So Neil Gellenborg is. Uh... A uh, faculty member in the Department of Biomedical Informatics with uh, myself and Zach Kahani at Harvard Medical School. And his group was responsible for putting together that amazing um, COVID clinical net website with all the 4C visualizations. So I, I asked him to um, join our group today to give us a little tour of that website and some background on how those um, visualizations were developed. Um, so, Neil, do you want to take it from there? Sure. I think I'm good to go. Um, I get, can I, okay, I can just share my screen here. Give me one moment um, to launch this thing. All right. <clears throat> so thank you, uh, Griffin, for the introduction and for the invitation to speak uh, to this group today. Uh, really interesting discussions about the user interface work, uh, I2B2. I'm uh, pretty excited about some of the things that I've seen here earlier today. Um, but I want to uh, talk about something slightly different. Um, as, as Griffin mentioned, um, my group and I are part of the uh, 4C um, consortium that um, has, has put together a very interesting data set as the process of collecting more data. Um, and, and we've been working on the visualizations for this, this project. So uh, what I want to do is just kind of give you a little a little bit of background on some of the decisions we made in the process and how we set up this website as well as the visualizations that are integrated with our website. So um, <clears throat> first of all, I think uh, in case uh, you're not familiar with 4C, which I would assume is, is fairly likely, um, it, the, uh, the consortium has taken this approach to use EHR data uh, to uh, ask critical clinical uh, and, and epidemiological questions about COVID-19. Uh, when we set out, I think it was not really clear to anyone what we might or might be able to find in the data. Um, ultimately, there was a focus on comorbidities and temporal, probably sort of double temporal, temporal changes in key lab values. And, and um, the whole approach is based on this idea that rather than trying to get IRBs in place and work out all the legal issues, it's to uh, only share data that can easily be shared. So this information has been locally aggregated at each individual hospital or each site, um, has been obfuscated. And uh, that information is what will be shared with the whole consortium for analysis and visualization. And, and of course, at that point, there's no more 
uh, the data is pretty pretty summarized, and so we were able to look at regional differences and some global commonalities. Uh, as as uh, uh, maybe have been mentioned earlier, there are uh, data from five different countries: uh, France, Germany, Singapore, um, Italy, and the United States. Uh, Thirty-six hospitals in total, about twenty-seven thousand cases, and uh, close to two hundred thousand lab values. So um, <clears throat> here's a sort of a graphical summary of this um, of this of this consortium and the approach it was taken. You see, there's I2D2 as one of the sources for HR data as well as OMOP. Um, the aggregation happening at the individual sites. Um, the merge happens after the data is submitted um, to a consortium, and then we have uh, daily counts of cases, demographics, diagnoses, and lab values, and that is the information that we uh, were asked to visualize. So, um, <clears throat> how did we do this? Oh, before I get there, um, I wanted to point out there is a preprint on Med Archive that has way more information that I'll be sharing with you right now. Um, my focus today is really on the, on the visualization and the technologies that we've used. But if you are interested in, in, in what we found in this first iteration, um, you can check out this preprint. And sorry, the URL at the bottom is, is not the right one, but we'll get to the GitHub URLs in a second. So um, thinking about the data um, and looking at this from a data visualization point of view, um, this is what my group does. We, we are um, heavily involved in all sorts of data visualization research in the context of biomedical data in the broadest sense. Um, you know, one thing that is obviously clear um, when we're dealing with a public health emergency such as COVID-19, this is not a typical environment in which data visualization research is happening. Um, we knew it's clear, obviously, we had to be prepared for very rapid turnaround. Um, we did not know what kind of data uh, there would be. We, the only thing we knew is it's all going to be highly aggregated. So any sort of cross referencing across different data tables would, wouldn't be possible beyond sort of the level of countries, maybe. Um, we also didn't know what the questions would be that, that the, uh, the clinical experts, and the, the, the medical doctors would want to ask about uh, these data sets. And so this is something um, that is, from a visualization point of view, you know, very atypical. Uh, you would want to start understanding what the problem is and what questions people want to answer with the data that they've collected before you start thinking about visualization. But we knew it would be simple. Um, and so, so what, what we sort of, how we phrased this as, as a problem is you know, we, we wanted to create and deploy highly customized interactive visualizations um, for a potentially very wide audience um, in a short period of time. How, how, how can we go about this? Um, now, this is not a completely new problem, but the, the bigger challenge that we saw here was um, the customization and the ability to, to, very, to very rapidly respond to requests and changes and what needs to be visualized. And so we decided against you know, the possibility of maybe setting up a Tableau dashboard or something like that, um, because we really didn't know what limitations that would, would um, uh, or what, what issues we would run into with, with a choosing a platform that is somewhat limited in terms of how you can visualize the data. So um, here's what we did. We decided to uh, use a visualization library called Altair that I can highly recommend, um, which is a Python library that uh, is used to generate um, definitions of Vega visualization. So Vega is, is grammar to describe uh, visualizations. Um, they are written out in, uh, as JSON, and then there's a, is a, is a um, <clears throat> interpreter that, that turns that into, into D3-based JavaScript visualizations that, that can you know, run in the browser. They're, they're also the SVG, so they're pretty easy to transfer around. So that was the first decision we made to use Altair because it does allow us to create interactive visualizations. Um, it, is, it is much, uh, in terms of the, the level at which you're operating on the data, it's much, much higher than say D3. D3 is extremely low level, very painful, uh, of course has enormous uh, flexibility, but we, we didn't think we would have to go that low. Although given that we've taken this approach uh, we could have gone back to D3 or something like that as well. Um, now, we knew that uh, a lot of processing would be needed on, on the data. Um, we would have to be flexible in terms of um, you know, pre-processing, uh, data transformations, uh, potentially some data, data cleaning. Uh, so we, we, we set this all up as Jupyter Notebooks, uh, where we wrote our Python code. 
Um, we didn't, uh, my group didn't get involved in the uh, sort of data integration uh, part that was handled by Griffin's team and, and uh, so data normalization, some, some analytical uh, work was done by Tianxi Kai's group, um, <clears throat> also part of uh, the Department of Biomedical Informatics. And um, so we picked up from, from, from what they had put together or many, many iterations, um, but, but that, is, uh, that is a detail. We knew that we wanted to make all of this very reproducible. That's why we wanted to use Jupyter Notebooks, which are easy to share, and I'll show you this in a moment. Um, that also meant we had to put the data somewhere, and we decided to make the data available through Figshare. Um, I'll show you this in a second as well. Um, <clears throat> and uh, then we built a website, the, the clinical, uh, COVID clinical at NAT website, uh, using Jekyll, which is a static site generator that um, is pretty popular, easy to extend, has, has nice ways of bringing in data, templates, et cetera. It's natively supported by GitHub, for example, if you want to uh, launch a website out of a GitHub repo. Um, in this case, though, we didn't uh, go directly through GitHub. We, we are deploying everything on Amazon Web Services. All right, so what does it look like? Here's the homepage uh, for COVIDClinical.net. Um, this is uh, really very, very basic, although the one thing I want to point out the, uh, the map that you see in there is actually data driven. Uh, this, is, this is set up, uh, again, there's, there's a corresponding, uh, there's the code for that map that is shown on the homepage is actually available through our GitHub repo. It's a Jupyter notebook. And um, if, if anyone wants to mess around with that, uh, change the colors or reuse it in any way or form, they can do that. Um, all of the data is on Figshare. Here's um, uh, sort of the main page, the most interesting part of all of this, and that's the, um, the data page. So we have uh, two types of information available here. Um, you see visualizations indicated by these little um, bar charts as well as data downloads. And you, um, we'll, we'll start playing around with this once we get to the demo. Um, here's one example of a visualization. I just wanna show you, you know, this is, this is on the website and <clears throat> that's uh, I think where I'm gonna jump right over to this uh, site here. Let's go to clinical so we can actually start interacting with it. Um, <clears throat> so what we got here is the, um, actually, let me just open this as well. So here is, is the homepage uh, that you've seen before. Let me just let me make this a little larger. Um, <clears throat> so, the, um, yeah, you can see you know, it's, it's an interactive visualization. You can see how many hospitals at each of these sites uh, participated. Um, that's uh, that's uh, one of the, the perks of using um, tools like, like uh, Altair and Vega to, to create visualizations for a website. Okay, so um, let's just take a quick look at daily counts by country. I think most of you have seen these kind of uh, plots over and over and over again. Um, they're obviously extremely popular and, and, and Probably useful. Uh, the one thing here is, you know, it's an interactive visualization. Uh, no surprises here. You um, can go through this. And, and I think the one piece that was really, really important with our data, because each of these uh, countries had a really variable number of hospitals and number of cases that were contributing. So um, what almost all of our visualizations have uh, at the bottom is a corresponding count where you see the number of sites that actually contributed data uh, on for, for that specific day. And you see, you know, for example, Singapore um, has a very small number of sites contributing, in fact, only one. Uh, well, in the United States, we have a much larger number of sites. Um, we can also, um, you know, look at cumulative counts if you want to. And then the, the neat thing here is if you are interested in just looking at a subset of the data, uh, for example, we could just look at Germany, which is a small number. We can just select as a legend. We can compare this to Italy. Um, you see the, the obvious differences here. Um, but also, again, the number of uh, sites that contributed data were uh, quite different. So let's go back to the data um, and maybe take a quick look at the um, demographics, uh, just as a type of plot. Again, very simple. Um, I think this one is maybe more interesting. If you look at this by country, you can, you can actually see here, if you take out Singapore, um, or actually go through look at this, France, Germany, uh, the United States have very similar age distributions in our data set um, for these different age groups. But once you add Italy, um, you'll notice they have a, a quite a different distribution in their age groups. So they have a much larger number of older patients 
um, than the other three countries um, that have contributed a major number. And in Singapore, our data uh, set was fairly small. You see it's, it's uh, actually going the other way. They tend to be a slightly larger number of younger patients uh, relative to their size of their cohort. Okay. Um, one more thing I wanted to show before I uh, jump into, into the specifics of how we, we did this. Um, here are the labs. Um, so this is an overview of five key labs that we identified as, as being of interest. And, and, and here's something um, where, again, the, these, these detailed views at the bottom are, are really important um, because they help you interpret the data, right? So the, the one thing you see the variability going up here in terms of the, uh, like in this case, we're looking at creatinine over time. Well, why is the variability going up? Because the number of patients is going down very rapidly. So we have we combined both. Um, in this case, you can see the number of patients at the bottom as well as the number of hospitals that contributed data. Uh, again, we have the ability to select individual countries. We can also always add sort of the uh, average across all countries or the weighted mean in this case. Um, and we can you know, also use this to easily compare, for example, uh, which I think is interesting, maybe comparing Italy to the United States in terms of uh, data and profiles. Now, um, it, it's, you know, the, the insights um, are, are somewhat limited on this data set. But um, what you can uh, see, and, and this is, I think, um, one of the real motivations for us to make this um, so public and, and transparent is, you know, the data is messy. And this is something that I think we have to, to communicate as well, that, um, you know, for example, after the, the surgosphere uh, disaster uh, publications, after they had come out, I think, you know, people realized, well, you know, why is your data so clean? Real EHR data is not that clean. I'm probably preaching to the choir here. Um, in particular, when you start looking across many, many countries and many different hospitals. So um, we, we wanted to include this information uh, that, that our data really is somewhat messy. And um, in the end, like what we're looking for is a signal across many, many different hospitals, across many different individual patients. And so, so this is a, a key part of visualization in, in this context, I believe, is, is to communicate the, um, the, the quality of the data here. Um, we have uh, these lab values also per individual lab, so you can you know, choose whatever you're interested in. Um, for example, CRP looks, looks pretty nice. There are some others that look uh, actually terrible. Um, let's see if I can find one that looks uh, really bad. Um, but uh, for example, this one, yeah, right? So you have a massive outlier here. Uh, somehow the German data was, 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 was probably not correct um, around here. But what you can do is uh, you can, of course, zoom into these things. Um, you know, you can pick a subset off like a small window of the data. So if you're only interested in the first couple of days, we can, we can do this sort of standard interactions with the data. And then, you know, we have uh, various different plot types in here. You can look at it by site. You can look at variation um, of, of labs on, on the first day, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of stuff that I, I don't want to go into detail. What I do want to do in the remaining few minutes here is, um, you know, point out that we have all these links up here. So first of all, you can easily link to any of these tabs. Um, the, um, like if you want to share that with a colleague, you can, you can just uh, grab that link. Basically it adds, you know, which tab you're on to the, to the URL and you can send that over. I, these things are, you know, can be done in a much fancier way, but here, just as a reminder, we used like off the shelf technologies. We didn't want to build anything custom for this because we knew it had to be built really, really quickly. It had to be reliable. Um, and therefore it, we, we, we chose not to go into a full blown, you know, web application, uh, it's, it's, as I said, it's a static site. This is all, um, you know, you could download this thing and run it wherever you want without internet. Um, the only limitation is here, and, and this is one when things get interesting. So as I said, we have everything uh, open, it's in GitHub, so the visualization notebooks um, <clears throat> are in here. So you can uh, launch up a uh, binder, uh, which is essentially a, a service to uh, run Jupyter notebooks on the, on the web uh, for without the need to have a, your own Jupyter uh, server without the need to have a Jupyter hub. And so if I, this might take a second here to load up, uh, while it's loading, I can share with you the sad news that uh, we somehow broke um, in, in, a, in an effort to reorganize our, uh, Jup our GitHub repos for the second phase or for the coming phases of the project. We unfortunately broke these direct links that are in here. So if you click on them right now, they're broken. I 
Um, very confident that we'll fix that in the next hour or so. I just didn't want to touch it this moment, but um, those links will be back um, working um, in the very near future. So um, as this is launching, um, actually I can, if this is taking a moment, this is Binder just being a Binder and sometimes a little bit slow. I have another window that I can just share with you that might be easier so we don't have to uh, wait. So, um, whoops, am I sharing? Yes, so here we are. So here's a, here's a binder that I launched earlier. I hope it's still running. Um, so here's the list of all our notebooks that we have in this repo. Um, this is one that I opened earlier. Um, okay, so the binder is already down. No, that's not cool. Um, so this happens when you um, use free services. So there are, um, they actually make you wait for a little bit. Um, so, okay, so this is um, unfortunate that I cannot show you this, this moment, but in essence, what you get is you get to see the Jupyter Notebook in there. I'm just gonna, uh, I can show you the notebook directly in GitHub, but I can't launch it uh, without Binder. So we'll, we'll give it a moment, maybe it'll come up. Uh, so here's the demographics notebook. Um, <clears throat> that's loading too. Okay, so here's the notebook. Um, this one doesn't contain any, any, any immediate results, but um, the one thing I want to point out, like we have the data on Figshare. There's a URL uh, that you can go to, you know, has all the data published, uh, cross-referenced. You can grab it directly from here, it's versioned. Um, and then we're loading that directly from GitHub, from, 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 um, from, from Figshare into our, into our notebook and run it from there. Actually, here, um, I'm gonna switch back to the other browser window. Um, the notebooks are now running in Binder. Um, so here we are, let's look at the demographics, just open this up. Um, and so I could in theory directly link to this to this notebook from the website. Uh, once we fix the links, it's, it's gonna be working again. But you know, I basically come here as a random person on the internet, I have the whole thing. I can run the analyses in here, um, so let's check this out. Um, if you get any results here, okay, we are waiting for results. Um, okay, so it's it's doing something. I think we're just um, hit a unfortunately a very slow <laughs> server today. Um, so uh, for those of you familiar with Binder and Jupyter Notebooks, you can basically do whatever analysis you want in here. You get the visualizations, and then we have a process in place that, and, and I'll, I'll wrap up here. We have a process in place that when you generate a um, when you generate a visualization with the Jupyter notebook, we can embed it directly into the into the website as an SVG, um, and so there's it's it's very tightly integrated uh, with the with the deployed deployment process of the website. And so when you're going back here, you can always download these visualizations as a PNG or as an SVG. Um, and, and there's really, it goes directly from the notebook. No, okay. Just have, yeah, just have one minute. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's see. So this is. So, so Neil, I just, I just want to kind of, we have, so we have one minute. Kind of wrap yes, up yeah, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> this, this, is, this, is, this is, this is great. I, I knew a lot of this stuff existed with the connection to Jupiter and, uh, and, the, and the raw data, but I hadn't actually seen you go through it before. So, I mean, I learned a lot through all this. I just want to thank everybody for coming to this um, hour. And if you thought it was interesting on the ITVT Transmart website, you can, under the working group sections, you can sign up for our monthly um, webinars. And I hope to uh, see some of you um, in the upcoming months. Thank you, everyone, especially Anna Palmer and Nils, for taking the time to share your work today with us. Thank you.